Section nine of Gray's Anatomy, Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part one, by Henry Gray. Osteology, Introduction. Development of the Skeleton The general framework of the body is built up mainly of a series of bones, supplemented, however, in certain regions by pieces of cartilage. The bony part of the framework constitutes the skeleton. In the skeleton of the adult there are 206 distinct bones, as follows. The axial skeleton, divided into the vertebral column with 26 bones, the skull with 22 bones, the hyoid bone, 1, the ribs and sternum, 25, 74 bones in total. The appendicular skeleton, upper extremities, with 64 bones, lower extremities, with 62 bones, 126 altogether, and the auditory ossicles, 6, total of 206. The patellae are included in this enumeration, but the smaller sesamoid bones are not reckoned. Bones are divisible into four classes, long, short, flat, and irregular. Long bones. The long bones are found in the limbs, and each consists of a body or shaft and two extremities. The body, or diaphysis, is cylindrical, with a central cavity termed the medullary canal. The wall consists of dense, compact tissue of considerable thickness in the middle part of the body, but becoming thinner toward the extremities. Within the medullary canal is some cancellous tissue, scanty in the middle of the body, but greater in amount towards the ends. The extremities are generally expanded for the purpose of articulation and to afford broad surfaces for muscular attachment. They are usually developed from separate centres of ossification termed epiphyses, and consist of cancellous tissue surrounded by thin compact bone. The medullary canal and the spaces in the cancellous tissue are filled with marrow. The long bones are not straight, but curved, the curve generally taking place in two planes, thus affording greater strength to the bone. The bones belonging to this class are the clavicle, humerus, radius, ulna, femur, tibia, fibula, metacarpals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Short bones. Where a part of the skeleton is intended for strength and compactness combined with limited movement, it is constructed of a number of short bones, as in the carpus and tarsus. These consist of cancellous tissue covered by a thin crust of compact substance. The patellae, together with the other sesamoid bones, are by some regarded as short bones. Flat bones. Where the principal requirement is either extensive protection or the provision of broad surfaces for muscular attachment, the bones are expanded into broad, flat plates, as in the skull and the scapula. These bones are composed of two thin layers of compact tissue enclosing between them a variable quantity of cancellous tissue. In the cranial bones, the layers of compact tissue are familiarly known as the tables of the skull. The outer one is thick and tough, the inner is thin, dense and brittle, and hence is termed the vitreous table. The intervening cancellous tissue is called the diploe, and this, in certain regions of the skull, becomes absorbed so as to leave spaces filled with air, air sinuses, between the two tables. The flat bones are the occipital, parietal, frontal, nasal, lacrimal, vomer, scapula, os cocci, hip bone, sternum, ribs, and, according to some, the patella. Irregular bones. The irregular bones are such as, from their peculiar form, cannot be grouped under the preceding heads. They consist of cancellous tissue enclosed within a thin layer of compact bone. The irregular bones are the vertebrae, sacrum, coccyx, temporal, sphenoid, ethmoid, zygomatic, maxilla, mandible, palatine, inferior nasal concha, and hyoid. Surfaces of bones. 
if the surface of a bone be examined certain eminences and depressions are seen these eminences and depressions are of two kinds articular and non-articular well marked examples of articular eminences are found in the heads of the humerus and femur and of articular depressions in the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the acetabulum of the hip bone non-articular eminences are designated according to their form thus a broad rough uneven elevation is called a tuberosity protuberance or process a small rough prominence a tubercle a sharp slender pointed eminence a spine a narrow rough elevation running some way along the surface a ridge crest or line non-articular depressions are also of variable form and are described as fossae pits depressions grooves furrows fissures notches etc these non-articular eminences and depressions serve to increase the extent of surface for the attachment of ligaments and muscles, and are usually well marked in proportion to the muscularity of the subject. A short perforation is called a foramen, a longer passage a canal. 1. Development of the Skeleton The Skeleton The skeleton is of mesodermal origin, and may be divided into a, that of the trunk, axial skeleton, comprising the vertebral column, skull, ribs and sternum, and b, that of the limbs, appendicular skeleton. The vertebral column. The notochord is a temporary structure and forms a central axis, around which the segments of the vertebral column are developed. Note 11. In the amphioxus, the notochord persists and forms the only representative of a skeleton in that animal. End of note. It is derived from the endoderm and consists of a rod of cells which lies on the ventral aspect of the neural tube and reaches from the anterior end of the midbrain to the extremity of the tail. On either side of it is a column of paraxial mesoderm which becomes subdivided into a number of more or less cubical segments, the primitive segments. These are separated from one another by intersegmental septa and are arranged symmetrically on either side of the neural tube and notochord. To every segment a spinal nerve is distributed. At first each segment contains a central cavity, the myocoil, but this is soon filled with a core of angular and spindle-shaped cells. The cells of the segment become differentiated into three groups, which form respectively the cutis plate or dermatome, the muscle plate or myotome, and the sclerotome. The cutis plate is placed on the lateral and dorsal aspect of the myocoil and from it the true skin of the corresponding segment is derived. The muscle plate is situated on the medial side of the cutis plate and furnishes the muscles of the segment. The cells of the sclerotome are largely derived from those forming the core of the myocoil, and lie next to the notochord. Fusion of the individual sclerotomes in an anteroposterior direction soon takes place, and thus a continuous strand of cells, the sclerotogenous layer, is formed along the ventrolateral aspects of the neural tube. The cells of this layer proliferate rapidly, and extending medialward surround the notochord. At the same time they grow backward on the lateral aspects of the neural tube and eventually surround it, and thus the notochord and neural tube are enveloped by a continuous sheath of mesoderm, which is termed the membranous vertebral column. In this mesoderm the original segments are still distinguishable, but each is now differentiated into two portions, an anterior, consisting of loosely arranged cells, and a posterior, of more condensed tissue. Between the two portions the rudiment of the intervertebral fibrocartilage is laid down. Cells from the posterior mass grow into the intervals between the myotomes of the corresponding and succeeding segments, and extend both dorsally and ventrally. The dorsal extensions surround the neural tube and represent the future vertebral arch, while the ventral extend into the body wall as the costal processes. The hinder part of the posterior mass joins the anterior mass of the succeeding segment to form the vertebral body. Each vertebral body is therefore a composite of two segments, being formed from the posterior portion of one segment and the anterior part of that immediately behind it. The vertebral and costal arches are derivatives of the posterior part of the segment in front of the intersegmental septum with which they are associated. This stage is succeeded by that of the cartilaginous vertebral column. In the fourth week, two cartilaginous centers make their appearance, one on either side of the notochord. 
These extend around the notochord and form the body of the cartilaginous vertebra. A second pair of cartilaginous foci appear in the lateral parts of the vertebral bow and grow backward on either side of the neural tube to form the cartilaginous vertebral arch, and a separate cartilaginous center appears for each costal process. By the eighth week the cartilaginous arch has fused with the body, and in the fourth month the two halves of the arch are joined on the dorsal aspect of the neural tube. The spinous process is developed from the junction of the two halves of the vertebral arch. The transverse process grows out from the vertebral arch behind the costal process. In the upper cervical vertebrae, a band of mesodermal tissue connects the ends of the vertebral arches across the ventral surfaces of the intervertebral fibrocartilages. This is termed the hypochordal bar or brace. In all except the first, it is transitory and disappears by fusing with the fibrocartilages. In the atlas, however, the entire bow persists and undergoes chondrification. It develops into the anterior arch of the bone, while the cartilage representing the body of the atlas forms the dense or odontoid process which fuses with the body of the second cervical vertebra. The portions of the notochord which are surrounded by the bodies of the vertebrae atrophy and ultimately disappear, while those which lie in the centers of the intervertebral fibrocartilages undergo enlargement and persist throughout life as the central nucleus pulposus of the fibrocartilages. The ribs. The ribs are formed from the ventral or costal processes of the primitive vertebral bowels, the process extending between the muscle plates. In the thoracic region of the vertebral column, the costal processes grow lateralward to form a series of arches, the primitive costal arches. As already described, the transverse process grows out behind the vertebral end of each arch. It is at first connected to the costal process by continuous mesoderm, but this becomes differentiated later to form the costotransverse ligament. Between the costal process and the tip of the transverse process, the costotransverse joint is formed by absorption. The costal process becomes separated from the vertebral bow by the development of the costocentral joint. In the cervical vertebrae, the transverse process forms the posterior boundary of the forearm and transversarium, while the costal process corresponding to the head and neck of the rib fuses with the body of the vertebra and forms the anterolateral boundary of the foramen. The distal portions of the primitive costal arches remain undeveloped. Occasionally, the arch of the seventh cervical vertebra undergoes greater development, and by the formation of costovertebral joints, is separated off as a rib. In the lumbar region, the distal portions of the primitive costal arches fail. The proximal portions fuse with the transverse processes to form the transverse processes of descriptive anatomy. Occasionally, a movable rib is developed in connection with the first lumbar vertebra. In the sacral region, costal processes are developed only in connection with the upper three, or it may be four, vertebrae. The processes of adjacent segments fuse with one another to form the lateral part of the sacrum. The coxygeal vertebrae are devoid of costal processes. The sternum. The ventral ends of the ribs become united to one another by a longitudinal bar termed the sternal plate, and opposite the first seven pairs of ribs these sternal plates fuse in the middle line to form the manubrium and body of the sternum. The xiphoid process is formed by a backward extension of the sternal plates. The skull. Up to a certain age, the development of the skull corresponds with that of the vertebral column, but it is modified later in association with the expansion of the brain vesicles, the formation of the organs of smell, sight and hearing, and the development of the mouth and pharynx. The notochord extends as far forward as the anterior end of the midbrain, and becomes partly surrounded by mesoderm. The posterior part of this mesodermal investment corresponds with the basilar part of the occipital bone and shows a subdivision into four segments, which are separated by the roots of the hypoglossal nerve. The mesoderm then extends over the brain vesicles, and thus the entire brain is enclosed by a mesodermal investment, which is termed the membranous cranium. From the inner layer of this, the bones of the skull and the membranes of the brain are developed. From the outer layer, the muscles, blood vessels, true skin, and subcutaneous tissues of the scalp. In the shark and dogfish, this membranous cranium undergoes complete chondrification and forms the cartilaginous skull or chondrocranium of these animals. In mammals, on the other hand, 
the process of chondrification is limited to the base of the skull, the roof and sides being covered in by membrane. Thus the bones of the base of the skull are preceded by cartilage, those of the roof and sides by membrane. The posterior part of the base of the skull is developed around the notochord and exhibits a segmented condition analogous to that of the vertebral column, while the anterior part arises in front of the notochord and shows no regular segmentation. The base of the skull may therefore be divided into a. a caudal or vertebral, and b. a precaudal or prevertebral portion. In the lower vertebrates two pairs of cartilages are developed, viz. a pair of paracaudal cartilages, one on either side of the notochord, and a pair of precaudal cartilages, the trabeculi cranii, in front of the notochord. The paracaudal cartilages unite to form a basilar plate, from which the cartilaginous part of the occipital bone and the basis phenoid are developed. On the lateral aspects of the paracaudal cartilages the auditory vesicles are situated, and the mesoderm enclosing them is soon converted into cartilage, forming the cartilaginous ear capsules. These cartilaginous ear capsules, which are of an oval shape, fuse with the sides of the basilar plate, and from them arise the petrous and mastoid portions of the temporal bones. The trabeculi cranii are two curved bars of cartilage which embrace the hypophysis cerebri. Their posterior ends soon unite with the basilar plate, while their anterior ends join to form the ethmoidal plate, which extends forwards between the forebrain and the olfactory pits. Later the trabeculi meet and fuse below the hypophysis, forming the floor of the fossa hypophysios and so cutting off the anterior lobe of the hypophysis from the stermodium. The median part of the ethmoidal plate forms the bony and cartilaginous parts of the nasal septum. From the lateral margins of the trabeculi cranii three processes grow out on either side. The anterior forms the ethmoidal labyrinth and the lateral and alar cartilages of the nose. The middle gives rise to the small wing of the sphenoid, while from the posterior the great wing and lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid are developed. The bones of the vault are of membranous formation, and are termed dermal or covering bones. They are partly developed from the mesoderm of the membranous cranium, and partly from that which lies outside the enterderm of the foregut. They comprise the upper part of the occipital squama, interparietal, the squamae and tympanic parts of the temporals, the parietals, the frontal, the voma, the medial pterygoid plates, and the bones of the face. Some of them remain distinct throughout life, e.g. parietal and frontal, while others join with the bones of the chondrocranium, e.g. interparietal, squamae of the temporals, and medial pterygoid plates. Recent observations have shown that, in mammals, the basicranial cartilage, both in the caudal and precaudal regions of the base of the skull, is developed as a single plate which extends from behind forward. In man, however, its posterior part shows an indication of being developed from two chondrifying centres which fuse rapidly in front and below. The anterior and posterior thirds of the cartilage surround the notochord, but its middle third lies on the dorsal aspect of the notochord, which in this region is placed between the cartilage and the wall of the pharynx. End of section 9section 10 of gray's anatomy part 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by morgan scorpion anatomy of the human body part 1 by henry gray bone part 1 structure and physical properties Bone is one of the hardest structures of the animal body. It possesses also a certain degree of toughness and elasticity. Its colour, in a fresh state, is pinkish-white externally and deep red within. On examining a section of any bone, it is seen to be composed of two kinds of tissue, one of which is dense in texture, like ivory, and is termed compact tissue. The other consists of slender fibres and lamellae, which join to form a reticular structure. This, from its resemblance to lattice work, is called cancellous tissue. The compact tissue is always placed on the exterior of the bone, 
the cancellous in the interior. The relative quality of these two kinds of tissue varies in different bones, and in different parts of the same bone, according as strength or lightness is requisite. Close examination of the compact tissue shows it to be extremely porous, so that the difference in structure between it and the cancellous tissue depends merely upon the different amounts of solid matter, and the size and number of spaces in each. The cavities are small in the compact tissue and the solid matter between them abundant, while in cancellous tissue the spaces are large and the solid matter is in smaller quantity. Bone during life is permeated by vessels, and is enclosed, except where it is coated with articular cartilage, in a fibrous membrane, the periosteum, by means of which many of these vessels reach the hard tissue. If the periosteum be stripped from the surface of the living bone, small bleeding points are seen which mark the entrance of the periosteal vessels, and on section during life every part of the bone exudes blood from the minute vessels which ramify in it. The interior of each of the long bones of the limbs presents a cylindrical cavity filled with marrow and lined by a highly vascular areolar structure, called the medullary membrane. The strength of bone compared with other materials. Substance. Medium steel. Weight in pounds per cubic foot. 490. Ultimate strength pounds per square inch. Tension. 65,000. Compression. 60,000. Shear. 40,000. Substance. Granite. Weight in pounds per cubic foot. 170. Ultimate strength. Pounds per square inch. Tension. 1,500. Compression. 15,000. Shear. 2,000. Substance. Oak. White. Weight in pounds per cubic foot. 46. Ultimate strength. Pounds per square inch. Tension. 12,500. Footnote indicates stresses with the grain, i.e., when the load is parallel to the long axis of the material, or parallel to the direction of the fibres of the material. End footnote. Compression, 7,000. Shear, 4,000. Footnote. Indicates unit stresses across the grain, i.e., at right angles to the direction of the fibres of the material. End footnote. Substance. Compact bone, low, weight in pounds per cubic foot, 119, ultimate strength, pounds per square inch. Tension, 13,200, compression, 18,000, shear, 11,800. Substance, compact bone, high, weight in pounds per cubic foot. Left blank, ultimate strength, pounds per square inch. Tension, 17,700, compression, 24,000, shear, 7,150. Periosteum. The periosteum adheres to the surface of each of the bones in nearly every part, but not to cartilaginous extremities. When strong tendons or ligaments are attached to a bone, the periosteum is incorporated with them. It consists of two layers closely united together, the outer one formed chiefly of connective tissue, containing occasionally a few fat cells, the inner one of elastic fibres of the finer kind, forming dense membranous networks, which again can be separated into several layers. In young bones the periosteum is thick and very vascular, and is intimately connected at either end of the bone with the epiphyseal cartilage, but less closely with the body of the bone, from which it is separated by a layer of soft tissue, containing a number of granular corpuscles, or osteoblasts, by which ossification proceeds on the exterior of the young bone. Later in life the periosteum is thinner and less vascular, and the osteoblasts are converted into an epithelioid layer on the deep surface of the periosteum. The periosteum serves as a nidus for the ramification of the vessels previous to their distribution in the bone, hence the liability of bone to exfoliation or necrosis when denuded of this membrane by injury or disease. Fine nerves and lymphatics, which generally accompany the arteries, may also be demonstrated in the periosteum. Marrow The marrow not only fills up the cylindrical cavities in the bodies of the long bones, but also occupies the spaces of the cancellous tissue and extends into the larger bony canals, haversian canals, which contain the blood vessels. 
it differs in composition in different bones. In the bodies of the long bones, the marrow is of a yellow colour and contains, in 100 parts, 96 of fat, 1 of areolar tissue and vessels, and 3 of fluid with extractive matter. It consists of a basis of connective tissue supporting numerous blood vessels and cells, most of which are fat cells, but some are marrow cells, such as occur in the red marrow to be immediately described. In the flat and short bones, the articular ends of the long bones, in the bodies of the vertebrae, in the cranial diploe, and in the sternum and ribs of the marrow, is of a red colour, and contains in 100 parts, 75 of water, and 25 of solid matter, consisting of cell globulin, nucleoprotein, extractives, salts, and only a small proportion of fat. The red marrow consists of a small quantity of connective tissue, blood vessels, and numerous cells, some few of which are fat cells, but the great majority of roundish nucleated cells, the true marrow cells of colica. These marrow cells proper, or myelocytes, resemble in appearance lymphoid corpuscles, and like them are amoeboid. They generally have a higher line protoplasm, though some show granules either oxyphil or basophil in reaction. A number of eosinophil cells are also present. Among the marrow cells may be seen smaller cells, which possess a slightly pinkish hue. These are the erythroblasts or normoblasts, from which the red corpuscles of the adult are derived, and which may be regarded as descendants of the nucleated coloured corpuscles of the embryo. Giant cells, myeloplaxis, osteoclasts, large, multinucleated, protoplasmic masses are also to be found in both sorts of adult marrow, but more particularly in red marrow. They were believed by Colica to be concerned in the absorption of bone matrix, and hence the name which he gave to them, osteoclasts. They excavate in the bone small shallow pits or cavities, which are named howships foveoli, and in these they are found lying. Vessels and Nerves of Bone The blood vessels of bone are very numerous. Those of the compact tissue are derived from a close and dense network of vessels ramifying in the periosteum. From this membrane vessels pass into the minute orifices in the compact tissue, and run through the canals which traverse its substance. The cancellous tissue is supplied in a similar way, but by less numerous and larger vessels, which, perforating the outer compact tissue, are distributed to the cavities of the spongy portion of the bone. In the long bones, numerous apertures may be seen at the ends near the articular surfaces. Some of these give passage to the arteries of the larger set of vessels referred to but the most numerous and largest apertures are for some of the veins of the cancellous tissue, which emerge apart from the arteries. The marrow in the body of a long bone is supplied by one large artery, or sometimes more, which enters the bone at the nutrient foramen, situated in most cases near the centre of the body, and perforates obliquely the compact structure. The medullary or nutrient artery, usually accompanied by one or two veins, sends branches upward and downward, which ramify in the medullary membrane and give twigs to the adjoining canals. The ramifications of this vessel anastomose with the arteries of the cancellous and compact tissues. In most of the flat, and in many of the short spongy bones, one or more large apertures are observed, which transmit to the central parts of the bone vessels corresponding to the nutrient arteries and veins. The veins emerge from the long bones in three places, colica. One, one or two large veins accompany the artery. 2. Numerous large and small veins emerge at the articular extremities. 3. Many small veins pass out of the compact substance. In the flat cranial bones the veins are large, very numerous, and run in tortuous canals in the diploic tissue, the sides of the canals being formed by thin lamellae of bone, perforated here and there for the passage of branches from the adjacent cancelli. The same condition is also found in all cancellous tissue, the veins being enclosed and supported by osseous material and having exceedingly thin coats. When a bone is divided, the vessels remain patulous and do not contract in the canals in which they are contained. Lymphatic vessels, in addition to those found in the periosteum, have been traced by Cruikshank into the substance of bone, and Klein describes them as running in the Haversian canals. Nerves are distributed freely to the periosteum and accompany the nutrient arteries into the interior of the bone. 
they are said by colica to be most numerous in the articular extremities of the long bones in the vertebrae and in the larger flat bones minute anatomy a transverse section of dense bone may be cut with a saw and ground down until it is sufficiently thin if this be examined with a rather low power the bone will be seen to be mapped out into a number of circular districts each consisting of a central hole surrounded by a number of concentric rings these districts are termed haversian systems the central hole is an haversian canal and the rings are layers of bony tissue arranged concentrically around the central canal and termed lamellae moreover on closer examination it will be found that between these lamellae and therefore also arranged concentrically around the central canal are a number of little dark spots the lacunae and that these lacunae are connected with each other and with the central haversian canal by a number of fine dark lines which radiate like the spokes of a wheel and are called canaliculi filling in the irregular intervals which are left between these circular systems are other lamellae with their lacunae and canaliculi running in various directions but more or less curved they are termed interstitial lamellae again other lamellae found on the surface of the bone are arranged parallel to its circumference they are termed circumferential or by some authors primary or fundamental lamellae to distinguish them from those laid down around the axis of the haversian canals which are then termed secondary or special lamellae the haversian canals seen in a transverse section of bone as round holes at or about the center of each haversian system may be demonstrated to be true canals if a longitudinal section be made it will then be seen that the canals run parallel with the longitudinal axis of the bone for a short distance and then branch and communicate they vary considerably in size some being as much as zero point twelve millimeters in diameter the average size is however about zero point zero five millimeters near the medullary cavity the canals are larger than those near the surface of the bone each canal contains one or two blood vessels with a small quantity of delicate connective tissue and some nerve filaments in the larger ones there are also lymphatic vessels and cells with branching processes which communicate through the canaliculi with the branched processes of certain bone cells in the substance of the bone those canals near the surface of the bone open upon it by minute orifices and those near the medullary cavity open in the same way into this space so that the whole of the bone is permeated by a system of blood vessels running through the bony canals in the centers of the haversian systems the lamellae are thin plates of bony tissue encircling the central canal and may be compared for the sake of illustration to a number of sheets of paper pasted one over another around a central hollow cylinder after macerating a piece of bone in dilute mineral acid these lamellae may be stripped off in a longitudinal direction as thin films if one of these be examined with a high power of the microscope it will be found to be composed of a finely reticular structure made up of very slender transparent fibres decussating obliquely and coalescing at the points of intersection these fibres are composed of fine fibrils identical with those of white connective tissue the intercellular matrix between the fibres is impregnated by a calcareous deposit which the acid dissolves in many places the various lamellae may be seen to be held together by tapering fibres which run obliquely through them pinning or bolting them together they were first described by sharpie and were named by him perforating fibres the lacunae are situated between the lamellae and consist of a number of oblong spaces in an ordinary microscopic section viewed by transmitted light they appear as fusiform opaque spots each lacuna is occupied during life by a branched cell termed a bone cell or bone corpuscle the processes from which extend into the canaliculi the canaliculi are exceedingly minute channels crossing the lamellae and connecting the lacunae with neighboring lacunae and also with the haversian canal from the haversian canal a number of canaliculi are given off which radiate from it and open into the first set of lacunae between the first and second lamellae from these lacunae a second set of canaliculi is given off these run outward to the next series of lacunae and so on until the periphery of the haversian system is reached here the canaliculi given off from the last series of lacunae do not communicate with the lacunae of neighboring haversian systems 
but after passing outward for a short distance, form loops and return to their own lacunae. Thus every part of an Haversian system is supplied with nutrient fluids derived from the vessel in the Haversian canal and distributed through the canaliculi and lacunae. The bone cells are contained in the lacunae, which, however, they do not completely fill. They are flattened and nucleated branched cells, homologous with those of connected tissue. The branches, especially in young bones, pass into the canaliculi from the lacunae. In thin plates of bone, as in the walls of the spaces of cancellous tissue, the haversian canals are absent, and the canaliculi open into the spaces of the cancellous tissue, medullary spaces, which thus have the same function as the haversian canals. End of section 10「Of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. Bone, Part 2. Chemical Composition. Bone consists of an animal and an earthy part intimately combined together. The animal part may be obtained by immersing a bone for a considerable time in dilute mineral acid, after which process the bone comes out exactly the same shape as before, but perfectly flexible, so that a long bone, one of the ribs for example, can easily be tied in a knot. If now a transverse section is made, the same general arrangement of the Haversian canals, lamellae, lacunae and canaliculi is seen. The earthy part may be separately obtained by calcination, by which the animal matter is completely burnt out. The bone will still retain its original form, but it will be white and brittle, will have lost about one-third of its original weight, and will crumble down with the slightest force. The earthy matter is composed chiefly of calcium phosphate, about 58% of the weight of the bone calcium carbonate about 7%, calcium fluoride and magnesium phosphate from 1 to 2% each and sodium chloride less than 1%. They confer on bone its hardness and rigidity, while the animal matter, osein, determines its tenacity. Ossification. Some bones are preceded by membrane, such as those forming the roof and sides of the skull. Others, such as the bones of the limbs, are preceded by rods of cartilage. Hence two kinds of ossification are described, the intramembranous and the intracartilaginous. Intramembranous ossification. In the case of bones which are developed in membrane, no cartilaginous mould precedes the appearance of the bony tissue. The membrane which occupies the place of the future bone is of the nature of connective tissue and ultimately forms the periosteum. It is composed of fibres and granular cells in a matrix. The peripheral portion is more fibrous, while in the interior the cells or osteoblasts predominate. The whole tissue is richly supplied with blood vessels. At the outset of the process of bone formation, a little network of spicules is noticed radiating from the point or center of ossification. These rays consist at their growing points of a network of fine clear fibers and granular corpuscles with an intervening ground substance. The fibres are termed osteogenic fibres, and are made up of fine fibrils differing little from those of white fibrous tissue. The membrane soon assumes a dark and granular appearance from the deposition of calcareous granules in the fibres and in the intervening matrix, and in the calcified material some of the granular corpuscles or osteoblasts are enclosed. By the fusion of the calcareous granules the tissue again assumes a more transparent appearance, but the fibres are no longer so distinctly seen. The involved osteoblast from the corpuscles of the future bone, the spaces in which they are enclosed, constituting the lacunae. The involved osteoblasts form the corpuscles of the future bone, the spaces in which they are enclosed, constituting the lacunae. As the osteogenetic fibres grow out to the periphery, they continue to calcify and give rise to fresh bone spicules. Thus a network of bone is formed the meshes of which contain the blood vessels and a delicate connective tissue crowded with osteoblasts. 
the bony trabeculi thickened by the addition of fresh layers of bone formed by the osteoblasts on the surface, and the meshes are correspondingly encroached upon. Subsequently, successive layers of bony tissue are deposited under the periosteum and around the larger vascular channels which become the haversian canals, so that the bone increases much in thickness. Intercartilaginous ossification Just before ossification begins, the mass is entirely cartilaginous, and in a long bone, which may be taken as an example, the process commences in the center and proceeds towards the extremities, which for some time remain cartilaginous. Subsequently, a similar process commences in one or more places in those extremities and gradually extends through them. The extremities do not, however, become joined to the body of the bone by bony tissue until growth has ceased. Between the body and either extremity, a layer of cartilaginous tissue, termed the epiphyseal cartilage, persists for a definite period. The first step in the ossification of the cartilage is that the cartilage cells, at the point where ossification is commencing, and which is termed a centre of ossification, enlarge and arrange themselves in rows. The matrix in which they are embedded increases in quantity, so that the cells become further separated from each other. A deposit of calcareous material now takes place in this matrix, between the rows of cells, so that they become separated from each other by longitudinal columns of calcified matrix, presenting a granular and opaque appearance. Here and there the matrix between two cells of the same row also become calcified, and transverse bars of calcified substance would stretch from one calcareous column to another. Thus there are longitudinal groups of the cartilage cells enclosed in oblong cavities, the walls of which are formed of calcified matrix which cuts off all nutrition from the cells. The cells in consequence atrophy, leaving spaces called the primary areoli. At the same time that this process is going on in the center of the solid bar of cartilage, certain changes are taking place on its surface. This is covered by a very vascular membrane, the perichondrium, entirely similar to the embryonic connective tissue already described as constituting the basis of membrane bone. On the inner surface of this, that is to say, on the surface in contact with the cartilage, are gathered the formative cells, the osteoblasts. By the agency of these cells, a thin layer of bony tissue is formed between the perichondrium and the cartilage, by the intramembranous mode of ossification just described. There are then, in this first stage of ossification, two processes going on simultaneously in the centre of the cartilage, the formation of a number of oblong spaces, formed of calcified matrix and containing the withered cartilage cells, and on the surface of the cartilage the formation of a layer of true membrane bone. The second stage consists in the prolongation into the cartilage of processes of the deeper or osteogenetic layer of the perichondrium, which has now become periosteum. The processes consist of blood vessels and cells, osteoblasts or bone formers, and osteoclasts or bone destroyers. The latter are similar to the giant cells, myeloplaxes, found in marrow, and they excavate passages through the new formed bony layer by absorption and pass through it into the calcified matrix. Wherever these processes come in contact with the calcified walls of the primary areola, they absorb them, and thus cause a fusion of the original cavities and the formation of larger spaces, which are termed the secondary areoli or medullary spaces. These secondary spaces become filled with embryonic marrow, consisting of osteoblasts and vessels, derived, in the manner described above, from the osteogenetic layer of the periosteum. Thus far there has been traced the formation of enlarged spaces, secondary areoli, the perforated walls of which are still formed by calcified cartilage matrix, containing an embryonic marrow derived from the processes sent in from the osteogenetic layer of the periosteum, and consisting of blood vessels and osteoblasts. The walls of these secondary areoli are at this time of only inconsiderable thickness, but they become thickened by the deposition of layers of true bone on their surface. The process takes place in the following manner. Some of the osteoblasts of the embryonic marrow, after undergoing rapid division, arrange themselves as an epithelioid layer on the surface of the wall of the space. This layer of osteoblasts forms a bony stratum, and thus the wall of the space becomes gradually covered with a layer of true osseous substance in which some of the bone-forming cells are included as bone corpuscles. The next stage in the process consists in the removal of these primary bone spicules by the osteoclasts. 
one of these giant cells may be found lying in a house ship's foveola at the free end of each spicule. The removal of the primary spicules go on pari passu with the formation of permanent bone by the periosteum, and in this way the medullary cavity of the body of the bone is formed. This series of changes has been gradually proceeding towards the end of the body of the bone, so that in the ossifying bone all the changes described above may be seen in different parts, from the true bone at the centre of the body to the hyaline cartilages at the extremities. While the ossification of the cartilaginous body is extending towards the articular ends, the cartilage immediately in advance of the osseous tissue continues to grow until the length of the adult bone is reached. During the period of growth, the articular end, or epiphysis, remains for some time entirely cartilaginous. Then a bony centre appears, and initiates in it the process of intracartilaginous ossification, but this process never extends to any great distance. The epiphysis remains separated from the body by a narrow cartilaginous layer for a definite time. This layer ultimately ossifies. The distinction between body and epiphysis is obliterated, and the bone assumes its completed form and shape. The same remarks also apply to such processes of bone as are separately ossified, e.g. the trochanters of the femur. The bones therefore continue to grow until the body has acquired its full stature. They increase in length by ossification continuing to extend behind the epiphyseal cartilage, which goes on growing in advance of the ossifying process. They increase in circumference by deposition of new bone from the deeper layer of the periosteum, on their external surface, and at the same time an absorption takes place from within, by which the medullary cavities are increased. The permanent bone formed by the periosteum when first laid down is cancellous in structure. Later the osteoblasts contained in its spaces become arranged in the concentric layers characteristic of the Haversian systems, and are included as bone corpuscles. The number of ossific centres varies in different bones. In most of the short bones ossification commences at a single point near the centre, and proceeds towards the surface. In the long bones there is a central point of ossification for the body or diaphysis, and one or more for each extremity, the epiphysis. That for the body is the first to appear. The times of union of the epiphysis with the body vary inversely with the dates at which their ossifications begin, with the exception of the fibula, and regulate the direction of the nutrient arteries of the bones. Thus the nutrient arteries of the bones of the arm and forearm are directed towards the elbow, since the epiphysis at this joint become united to the bodies before those at the opposite extremities. In the lower limb, on the other hand, the nutrient arteries are directed away from the knee, that is upwards in the femur, downward in the tibia and fibula, and in them it is observed that the upper epiphysis of the femur and the lower epiphysis of the tibia and fibula unite first with the bodies. Where there is only one epiphysis, the nutrient artery is directed towards the other end of the bone, as towards the acromial end of the clavicle, towards the distal ends of the metacarpal bone of the thumb, and the metatarsal bone of the great toe, and towards the proximal ends of the other metacarpal and metatarsal bones. Parsons groups epiphyses under three headings, viz. 1. Pressure epiphysis, appearing at the articular ends of the bones and transmitting the weight of the body from bone to bone. 2. Traction epiphyses, associated with the insertion of muscles and originally sesamoid structures, though not necessarily sesamoid bones. And 3 atavistic epiphyses, representing parts of the skeleton which at one time formed separate bones but which have lost their function and only appear as separate ossifications in early life. End of section 11 Section 12 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Vertebral Column. Columna vertebralis, spinal column. The vertebral column is a flexuous and flexible column formed of a series of bones called vertebrae. The vertebrae are 33 in number, and are grouped under the names cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal, according to the regions they occupy. There are seven in the cervical region, twelve in the thoracic, five in the lumbar, five in the sacral, and four in the coccygeal. 
This number is sometimes increased by an additional vertebra in one region, or it may be diminished in one region, the deficiency often being supplied by an additional vertebra in another. The number of cervical vertebrae is, however, very rarely increased or diminished. The vertebrae in the upper three regions of the column remain distinct throughout life, and are known as true or movable vertebrae. Those of the sacral and coccygeal regions, on the other hand, are termed false or fixed vertebrae, because they are united with one another in the adult to form two bones, five forming the upper bone, or sacrum, and four the terminal bone, or coccyx. With the exception of the first and second cervical, the true or movable vertebrae present certain common characteristics, which are best studied by examining one from the middle of the thoracic region. GENERAL CHARACTERISTICS OF A VERTEBRA A typical vertebra consists of two essential parts, namely an anterior segment, the body, and a posterior part, the vertebral or neural arch. These enclose a foramen, the vertebral foramen. The vertebral arch consists of a pair of pedicles and a pair of laminae, and supports seven processes, namely four articular, two transverse, and one spinous. When the vertebrae are articulated with each other, the bodies form a strong pillar for the support of the head and trunk, and the vertebral foramina constitute a canal for the protection of the medulla spinalis, or spinal cord, while between every pair of vertebrae are two apertures, the intervertebral foramina, one on each side, for the transmission of the spinal nerves and vessels. Body, corpus vertebrae. The body is the largest part of a vertebra and is more or less cylindrical in shape. Its upper and lower surfaces are flattened and rough, and give attachment to the intervertebral fibrocartilages, and each presents a rim around its circumference. In front, the body is convex from side to side, and concave from above downward. Behind, it is flat from above downward, and slightly concave from side to side. Its anterior surface presents a few small apertures for the passage of nutrient vessels on the posterior surface is a single large irregular aperture, or occasionally more than one, for the exit of the basa vertebral veins from the body of the vertebra. Pedicles. Radices archi vertebrae. The pedicles are two short, thick processes which project backward, one on either side, from the upper part of the body, at the junction of its posterior and lateral surfaces. The concavities above and below the pedicles are named the vertebral notches, and when the vertebrae are articulated, the notches of each contiguous pair of bones form the intervertebral foramina already referred to. Laminae. The laminae are two broad plates directed backward and medialward from the pedicles. They fuse in the middle line posteriorly, and so complete the posterior boundary of the vertebral foramen. Their upper borders and the lower parts of their anterior surfaces are rough for the attachment of the ligmenta flava processes spinous process processus spinosus the spinous process is directed backward and downward from the junction of the laminae and serves for the attachment of muscles and ligaments articular processes the articular processes two superior and two inferior spring from the junctions of the pedicles and laminae the superior project upward and their articular surfaces are directed more or less backward the inferior project downward, and their surfaces look more or less forward. The articular surfaces are coated with hyaline cartilage. Transverse processes. Processes transversi. The transverse processes, two in number, project one at either side from the point where the lamina joins the pedicle, between the superior and inferior articular processes. They serve for the attachment of muscles and ligaments. Structure of a vertebra. The body is composed of cancellous tissue, covered by a thin coating of compact bone. The latter is perforated by numerous orifices, some of large size for the passage of vessels. The interior of the bone is traversed by one or two large canals for the reception of veins, which converge toward a single large irregular aperture, or several small apertures at the posterior part of the body. The thin bony lamellae of the cancellous tissue are more pronounced in lines perpendicular to the upper and lower surfaces, and are developed in response to greater pressure in this direction. The arch and processes projecting from it have thick coverings of compact tissue. End of section 12. Section 
thirteen of Gray's Anatomy, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part One, by Henry Gray. The cervical vertebrae, vertebrae cervicales. Cervical vertebrae are the smallest of the true vertebrae, and can be readily distinguished from those of the thoracic or lumbar regions by the presence of a foramen in each transverse process. The first, second, and seventh present exceptional features and must be separately described. The following characteristics are common to the remaining four. The body is small and broader from side to side than from before backward. The anterior and posterior surfaces are flattened and of equal depth, the former is placed on a lower level than the latter, and its inferior border is prolonged downward, so as to overlap the upper and fore part of the vertebra below. The upper surface is concave transversely, and presents a projecting lip on either side. The lower surface is concave from before backward, convex from side to side, and presents laterally shallow concavities which receive the corresponding projecting lips of the subjacent vertebra. The pedicles are directed lateral ward and backward, and are attached to the body midway between its upper and lower borders, so that the superior vertebral notch is as deep as the inferior, but it is at the same time narrower. The laminae are narrow and thinner above than below. The vertebral foramen is large and of a triangular form. The spinous process is short and bifid, the two divisions being often of unequal size. The superior and inferior articular processes on either side are fused to form an articular pillar, which projects lateralward from the junction of the pedicle and lamina. The articular facets are flat and of an oval form. The superior look backward, upward, and slightly medialward. The inferior forward, downward, and slightly lateralward. The transverse processes are each pierced by the foramen transversarium, which in the upper six vertebrae gives passage to the vertebral artery and vein and a plexus of sympathetic nerves. Each process consists of an anterior and a posterior part. The anterior portion is the homologue of the rib in the thoracic region and is therefore named the costal process or costal element. It arises from the side of the body and is directed lateralward in front of the foramen and ends in a tubercle, the anterior tubercle. The posterior part, the true transverse process, springs from the vertebral arch behind the foramen and is directed forward and lateralward. It ends in a flattened vertical tubercle, the posterior tubercle. These two parts are joined outside the foramen by a bar of bone which exhibits a deep sulcus on its upper surface for the passage of the corresponding spinal nerve. Footnote. The costal element of a cervical vertebra not only includes the portion which springs from the side of the body, but the anterior and posterior tubercles and the bar of bone which connects them. End of footnote. First cervical vertebra. The first cervical vertebra is named the atlas because it supports the globe of the head. Its chief peculiarity is that it has no body, and this is due to the fact that the body of the atlas has fused with that of the next vertebra. Its other peculiarities are that it has no spinous process, is ring-like, and consists of an anterior and a posterior arch and two lateral masses. The anterior arch forms about one-fifth of the ring. Its anterior surface is convex and presents at its center the anterior tubercle for the attachment of the longest coli muscles. Posteriorly it is concave and marked by a smooth oval or circular facet, fovea dentis, for articulation with the odontoid process, dens of the axis. The upper and lower borders, respectively, give attachment to the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane and the anterior atlanto-axial ligament. The former connects it with the occipital bone above and the latter with the axis below. The posterior arch forms about two-fifths of the circumference of the ring. It ends behind in the posterior tubercle, which is the rudiment of a spinous process and gives origin to the recti capitis posterioris minoris. The diminutive size of this process prevents any interference with the movements between the atlas and the skull. The posterior part of the arch presents above and behind a rounded edge for the attachment of the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, 
while immediately behind each superior articular process is a groove, sulcus arteriae vertebralis, sometimes converted into a foramen by a delicate bony spiculum which arches backward from the posterior end of the superior articular process. This groove represents the superior vertebral notch and serves for the transmission of the vertebral artery, which after ascending through the foramen in the transverse process, winds around the lateral mass in a direction backward and medialward. It also transmits the suboccipital first spinal nerve. On the undersurface of the posterior arch, behind the articular facets, are two shallow grooves, the inferior vertebral notches. The lower border gives attachment to the posterior atlantoaxial ligament, which connects it with the axis. The lateral masses are the most bulky and solid parts of the atlas, in order to support the weight of the head. Each carries two articular facets, a superior and an inferior. The superior facets are of large size, oval, concave, and approach each other in front, but diverge behind. They are directed upward, medialward, and a little backward, each forming a cup for the corresponding condyle of the occipital bone, and are admirably adapted to the nodding movements of the head. Not infrequently they are partially subdivided by indentations, which encroach upon their margins. The inferior articular facets are circular in form, flattened or slightly convex, and directed downward and medialward, articulating with the axis and permitting the rotary movements of the head. Just below the medial margin of each superior facet is a small tubercle, for the attachment of the transverse atlantal ligament which stretches across the ring of the atlas and divides the vertebral foramen into two unequal parts, the anterior or smaller receiving the odontoid process of the axis, the posterior transmitting the medulla spinalis and its membranes. This part of the vertebral canal is of considerable size, much greater than is required for the accommodation of the medulla spinalis, and hence lateral displacement of the atlas may occur without compression of this structure. The transverse processes are large, they project lateralward and downward from the lateral masses, and serve for the attachment of muscles which assist in rotating the head. They are long, and their anterior and posterior tubercles are fused into one mass. The foramen transversarium is directed from below, upward, and backward. Second cervical vertebra. The second cervical vertebra is named the epistrophius or axis because it forms the pivot upon which the first vertebra, carrying the head, rotates. The most distinctive characteristic of this bone is the strong odontoid process which rises perpendicularly from the upper surface of the body. The body is deeper in front than behind, and prolonged downward anteriorly so as to overlap the upper and fore part of the third vertebra. It presents in front a median longitudinal ridge, separating two lateral depressions for the attachment of the longest coli muscles. Its undersurface is concave from before backward, and convex from side to side. The dens or odontoid process exhibits a slight constriction or neck where it joins the body. On its anterior surface is an oval or nearly circular facet for articulation with that on the anterior arch of the atlas. On the back of the neck and frequently extending onto its lateral surfaces is a shallow groove for the transverse atlantal ligament which retains the process in position. The apex is pointed and gives attachment to the apical odontoid ligament. Below the apex the process is somewhat enlarged and presents on either side a rough impression for the attachment of the alar ligament. These ligaments connect the process to the occipital bone. The internal structure of the odontoid process is more compact than that of the body. The pedicles are broad and strong, especially in front, where they coalesce with the sides of the body and the root of the odontoid process. They are covered above by the superior articular surfaces. The laminae are thick and strong, and the vertebral foramen large, but smaller than that of the atlas. The transverse processes are very small, and each ends in a single tubercle. Each is perforated by the foramen transversarium, which is directed obliquely upward and lateralward. The superior articular surfaces are round, slightly convex, directed upward and lateralward, and are supported on the body, pedicles, and transverse processes. The inferior articular surfaces have the same direction as those of the other cervical vertebrae. The superior vertebral notches are very shallow and lie behind the articular processes. The inferior lie in front of the articular processes, as in the other cervical vertebrae. 
The spinous process is large, very strong, deeply channeled on its under surface, and presents a bifid, tuberculated extremity. The seventh cervical vertebra. The most distinct characteristic of this vertebra is the existence of a long and prominent spinous process, hence the name vertebra prominens. This process is thick, nearly horizontal in direction, not bifurcated, but terminating in a tubercle into which the lower end of the lingamentum nuce is attached. The transverse processes are of considerable size, their posterior roots are large and prominent, while the anterior are small and faintly marked. The upper surface of each has usually a shallow sulcus for the eighth spinal nerve, and its extremity seldom presents more than a trace of bifurcation. The foramen transversarium may be as large as that in the other cervical vertebrae, but is generally smaller on one or both sides. Occasionally it is double, sometimes it is absent. On the left side it occasionally gives passage to the vertebral artery. More frequently the vertebral vein traverses it on both sides, but the usual arrangement is for both artery and vein to pass in front of the transverse process and not through the foramen. Sometimes the anterior root of the transverse process attains a large size and exists as a separate bone, which is known as a cervical rib. End of section 13section 14 of gray's anatomy part 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org anatomy of the human body part 1 by henry gray the thoracic vertebrae vertebrae thoracales the thoracic vertebrae are intermediate in size between those of the cervical and lumbar regions. They increase in size from above downward, the upper vertebrae being much smaller than those in the lower part of the region. They are distinguished by the presence of facets on the sides of the bodies for articulation with the heads of the ribs, and facets on the transverse processes of all, except the eleventh and twelfth, for articulation with the tubercles of the ribs. The bodies in the middle of the thoracic region are heart-shaped, and as broad in the anterior-posterior as in the transverse direction. At the ends of the thoracic region they resemble respectively those of the cervical and lumbar vertebrae. They are slightly thicker behind than in front, flat above and below, convex from side to side in front, deeply concave behind, and slightly constricted laterally and in front. They present on either side two costal demifacets, one above, near the root of the pedicle, the other below, in front of the inferior vertebral notch. These are covered with cartilage in the fresh state, and when vertebrae are articulated with one another, form, with the intervening intervertebral fibrocartilages, oval surfaces for the reception of the heads of the ribs. The pedicles are directed backward and slightly upward, and the inferior vertebral notches are of a large size, deeper than in any other region of the vertebral column. The laminae are broad, thick, and imbricated, that is to say, they overlap those of subadjacent vertebrae like tiles on a roof. The vertebral foramen is small and of a circular form. The spinous process is long, triangular on coronal section, directed obliquely downward, and ends in a tuberculated extremity. These processes overlap from the fifth to the eighth, but are less oblique in direction above and below. The superior articular processes are thin plates of bone projecting upward from the junctions of the pedicles and laminae. Their articular facets are practically flat, and are directed backward and a little lateralward and upward. The inferior articular processes are fused to a considerable extent with the laminae, and project but slightly beyond their lower borders. Their facets are directed forward and a little medialward and downward. The transverse processes arise from the arch behind the superior articular processes and pedicles. They are thick, strong, and of considerable length, directed obliquely backward and lateralward, and each ends in a clubbed extremity, on the front of which is a small, concave surface for articulation with the tubercle of a rib. The first, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth thoracic vertebrae present certain peculiarities and must be specially considered. The first thoracic vertebra has, on either side of the body, an entire articular facet for the head of the first rib, and a demi-facet for the upper half of the head of the second rib. The body is like that of a cervical vertebra, being broad transversely, its upper surface is concave, 
and lipped on either side. The superior articular surfaces are directed upward and backward. The spinous process is thick, long, and almost horizontal. The transverse processes are long, and the upper vertebral notches are deeper than those of the other thoracic vertebrae. The ninth thoracic vertebra may have no demifacets below. In some subjects, however, it has two demifacets on either side. When this occurs, the tenth has only demifacets at the upper part. The tenth thoracic vertebra has, except in the cases just mentioned, an entire articular facet on either side, which is placed partly on the lateral surface of the pedicle. In the eleventh thoracic vertebra, the body approaches in its form and size to that of the lumbar vertebrae. The articular facets for the heads of the ribs are of large size and placed chiefly on the pedicles, which are thicker and stronger in this and the next vertebra than in any other part of the thoracic region. The spinous process is short and nearly horizontal in direction. The transverse processes are very short, tuberculated at their extremities, and have no articular facets. The twelfth thoracic vertebra has the same general characteristics as the eleventh, but may be distinguished from it by its inferior articular surfaces being convex and directed lateralward, like those of the lumbar vertebrae. By the general form of the body, laminae and spinous process, in which it resembles the lumbar vertebrae, and by each transverse process being subdivided into three elevations, the superior, inferior, and lateral tubercles, the superior and inferior correspond to the mammillary and accessory processes of the lumbar vertebrae. Traces of similar elevations are found on the transverse processes of the 10th and 11th thoracic vertebrae. The Lumbar Vertebrae Vertebrae Lumbalis The lumbar vertebrae are the largest segments of the movable part of the vertebral column and can be distinguished by the absence of a foramen in the transverse process and by the absence of facets on the sides of the body. The body is large, wider from side to side than from before backward, and a little thicker in front than behind. It is flattened or slightly concave above and below, concave behind, and deeply constricted in front and at the sides. The pedicles are very strong, directed backward from the upper part of the body. Consequently, the inferior vertebral notches are of considerable depth. The laminae are broad, short, and strong. The vertebral foramen is triangular, larger than in the thoracic, but smaller than in the cervical region. The spinous process is thick, broad, and somewhat quadrilateral. It projects backward and ends in a rough, uneven border, thickest below, where it is occasionally notched. The superior and inferior articular processes are well defined, projecting respectively upward and downward from the junctions of pedicles and laminae. The facets on the superior processes are concave and look backward and medialward. Those on the inferior are convex and are directed forward and lateralward. The former are wider apart than the latter, since in the articulated column the inferior articular processes are embraced by the superior processes of the subadjacent vertebra. The transverse processes are long, slender, and horizontal in the upper three lumbar vertebrae. They incline a little upward in the lower two. In the upper three vertebrae they arise from the junctions of the pedicles and laminae, but in the lower two they are set farther forward and spring from the pedicles and posterior parts of the bodies. They are situated in front of the articular processes instead of behind them, as in the thoracic vertebrae, and are homologous with the ribs. Of the three tubercles noticed in connection with the transverse processes of the lower thoracic vertebrae, the superior one is connected in the lumbar region with the back part of the superior articular process, and is named the mammillary process. The inferior is situated at the back part of the base of the transverse process, and is called the accessory process. The fifth lumbar vertebra is characterized by its body being much deeper in front than behind, which accords with the prominence of the sacrovertebral articulation, by the smaller size of its spinous process, by the wide interval between the inferior articular processes, and by the thickness of its transverse processes, which spring from the body as well as from the pedicles. End of section 14section 15 of gray's anatomy part 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org anatomy of the human body part 1 by henry gray 
the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae consist at an early period of life of nine separate segments which are united in the adult so as to form two bones five entering into the formation of the sacrum four into that of the coccyx sometimes the coccyx consists of five bones occasionally the number is reduced to three the sacrum os sacrum the sacrum is a large triangular bone situated in the lower part of the vertebral column and at the upper and back part of the pelvic cavity where it is inserted like a wedge between the two hip bones its upper part or base articulates with the last lumbar vertebra its apex with the coccyx it is curved upon itself and placed very obliquely its base projecting forward and forming the prominent sacrovertebral angle when articulated with the last lumbar vertebra its central part is projected backward so as to give increased capacity to the pelvic cavity pelvic surface facies pelvina the pelvic surface is concave from above downward and slightly so from side to side its middle part is crossed by four transverse ridges the positions of which correspond with the original planes of separation between the five segments of the bone the portions of bone intervening between the ridges are the bodies of the sacral vertebrae the body of the first segment is of large size and in form resembles that of a lumbar vertebra the succeeding ones diminish from above downward are flattened from before backward and curved so as to accommodate themselves to the form of the sacrum being concave in front convex behind at the ends of the ridges are seen the anterior sacral foramina four in number on either side somewhat rounded in form diminishing in size from above downward and directed lateralward and forward they give exit to the anterior divisions of the sacral nerves and entrance to the lateral sacral arteries lateral to these foramina are the lateral parts of the sacrum each consisting of five separate segments at an early period of life in the adult these are blended with the bodies and with each other each lateral part is traversed by four broad shallow grooves which lodge the anterior divisions of the sacral nerves and are separated by prominent ridges of bone which give origin to the pyriformis muscle if a sagittal section be made through the centre of the sacrum the bodies are seen to be united at their circumferences by bone wide intervals being left centrally which in the fresh state are filled by the intervertebral fibrocartilages in some bones this union is more complete between the lower than the upper segments dorsal surface facies dorsalis the dorsal surface is convex and narrower than the pelvic in the middle line it displays a crest the middle sacral crest surmounted by three or four tubercles the rudimentary spinous processes of the upper three or four sacral vertebrae on either side of the middle sacral crest is a shallow groove the sacral groove which gives origin to the multifidus the floor of the groove being formed by the united laminae of the corresponding vertebrae the laminae of the fifth sacral vertebra and sometimes those of the fourth fail to meet behind and thus a hiatus or deficiency occurs in the posterior wall of the sacral canal on the lateral aspect of the sacral groove is a linear series of tubercles produced by the fusion of the articular processes which together form the indistinct sacral articular crests the articular processes of the first sacral vertebra are large and oval in shape their facets are concave from side to side look backward and medialward and articulate with the facets on the inferior processes of the fifth lumbar vertebra the tubercles which represent the inferior articular processes of the fifth sacral vertebra are prolonged downward as rounded processes which are named the sacral cornua and are connected to the cornua of the coccyx lateral to the articular processes are the four posterior sacral foramina they are smaller in size and less regular in form than the anterior and transmit the posterior divisions of the sacral nerves on the lateral side of the posterior sacral foramina is a series of tubercles which represent the transverse processes of the sacral vertebrae and form the lateral crests of the sacrum the transverse tubercles of the first sacral vertebra are large and very distinct they together with the transverse tubercles of the second vertebra give attachment to the horizontal parts of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments those of the third vertebra give attachment to the oblique fasciculi of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments and those of the fourth and fifth 
to the sacrotuberous ligaments. Lateral surface. The lateral surface is broad above, but narrowed into a thin edge below. The upper half presents in front an ear-shaped surface, the auricular surface, covered with cartilage in the fresh state, for articulation with the ilium. Behind is a rough surface, the sacral tuberosity, on which are three deep and uneven impressions, for the attachment of the posterior sacroiliac ligament. The lower half is thin, and ends in a projection called the inferior lateral angle. Medial to this angle is a notch, which is converted into a foramen by the transverse process of the first piece of the coccyx, and transmits the anterior division of the fifth sacral nerve. The thin lower half of the lateral surface gives attachment to the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments, to some fibers of the gluteus maximus behind, and to the coccygeus in front base basis os sacri the base of the sacrum which is broad and expanded is directed upward and forward in the middle is a large oval articular surface the upper surface of the body of the first sacral vertebra which is connected with the under surface of the body of the last lumbar vertebra by an intervertebral fibrocartilage behind this is the large triangular orifice of the sacral canal which is completed by the laminae and spinous process of the first sacral vertebra the superior articular processes project from it on either side they are oval concave directed backward and medialward like the superior articular processes of a lumbar vertebra they are attached to the body of the first sacral vertebra and to the alley by short thick pedicles on the upper surface of each pedicle is a vertebral notch which forms the lower part of the foramen between the last lumbar and first sacral vertebrae on either side of the body is a large triangular surface which supports the psoas major and lumbosacral trunk and in the articulated pelvis is continuous with the iliac fossa this is called the ala it is slightly concave from side to side convex from before backward and gives attachment to a few of the fibers of the iliacus the posterior fourth of the ala represents the transverse process and its anterior three-fourths the costal process of the first sacral segment apex apex os sacri the apex is directed downward and presents an oval facet for articulation with the coccyx vertebral canal canalis sacralis sacral canal the vertebral canal runs throughout the greater part of the bone above it is triangular in form below its posterior wall is incomplete from the non-development of the laminae and spinous processes it lodges the sacral nerves and its walls are perforated by the anterior and posterior sacral foramina through which these nerves pass out structure the sacrum consists of cancellous tissue enveloped by a thin layer of compact bone articulations the sacrum articulates with four bones the last lumbar vertebra above the coccyx below and the hip bone on either side differences in the sacrum of the male and female in the female the sacrum is shorter and wider than in the male the lower half forms a greater angle with the upper the upper half is nearly straight the lower half presenting the greatest amount of curvature the bone is also directed more obliquely backward this increases the size of the pelvic cavity and renders the sacrovertebral angle more prominent in the male the curvature is more evenly distributed over the whole length of the bone and is altogether greater than in the female variations the sacrum in some cases consists of six pieces occasionally the number is reduced to four the bodies of the first and second vertebrae may fail to unite sometimes the uppermost transverse tubercles are not joined to the rest of the ala on one or both sides or the sacral canal may be open through a considerable part of its length in consequence of the imperfect development of the laminae and spinous processes the sacrum also varies considerably with respect to its degree of curvature. The coccyx, os coccygeus. The coccyx is usually formed of four rudimentary vertebrae. The number may, however, be increased to five or diminished to three. In each of the first three segments may be traced a rudimentary body and articular and transverse processes. The last piece, sometimes the third, is a mere nodule of bone. All the segments are destitute of pedicles, laminae, and spinous processes. The first is the largest. It resembles the lowest sacral vertebra and often exists as a separate piece. 
the last three diminish in size from above downward and are usually fused with one another surfaces the anterior surface is slightly concave and marked with three transverse grooves which indicate the junctions of the different segments it gives attachment to the anterior sacrococcygeal ligament and the levatorus ani and supports part of the rectum the posterior surface is convex marked by transverse grooves similar to those on the anterior surface and presents on either side a linear row of tubercles the rudimentary articular processes of the coccygeal vertebrae of these the superior pair are large and are called the coccygeal cornua they project upward and articulate with the cornua of the sacrum and on either side complete the foramen for the transmission of the posterior division of the fifth sacral nerve borders the lateral borders are thin and exhibit a series of small eminences which represent the transverse processes of the coccygeal vertebrae of these the first is the largest it is flattened from before backward and often ascends to join the lower part of the thin lateral edge of the sacrum thus completing the foramen for the transmission of the anterior division of the fifth sacral nerve the others diminish in size from above downward and are often wanting the borders of the coccyx are narrow and give attachment to either side to the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments to the coccygeus in front of the ligaments and to the gluteus maximus behind them base the base presents an oval surface for articulation with the sacrum apex the apex is rounded and has attached to it the tendon of the sphincter ani externus it may be bifid and is sometimes deflected to one or the other side ossification of the vertebral column each cartilaginous vertebra is ossified from three primary centers two for the vertebral arch and one for the body footnote a vertebra is occasionally found in which the body consists of two lateral portions a condition which proves that the body is sometimes ossified from two primary centers one on either side of the middle line End of footnote. ossification of the vertebral arches begins in the upper cervical vertebrae about the seventh or eighth week of fetal life and gradually extends down the column the ossific granules first appear in the situations where the transverse processes afterward project and spread backward to the spinous process forward into the pedicles and lateral ward into the transverse and articular processes ossification of the bodies begins about the eighth week in the lower thoracic region and subsequently extends upward and downward along the column the center for the body does not give rise to the whole of the body of the adult vertebra the posterior lateral portions of which are ossified by extensions from the vertebral arch centers the body of the vertebra during the first few years of life shows therefore two synchondroses neurocentral synchondroses transversing it along the planes of junction of the three centers in the thoracic region the facets for the heads of the ribs lie behind the neurocentral synchondroses and are ossified from the centers for the vertebral arch at birth the vertebra consists of three pieces the body and the halves of the vertebral arch during the first year the halves of the arch unite behind union taking place first in the lumbar region and then extending upward through the thoracic and cervical regions about the third year the bodies of the upper cervical vertebrae are joined to the arches on either side in the lower lumbar vertebrae the union is not completed until the sixth year before puberty no other changes occur excepting a gradual increase of these primary centers the upper and under surfaces of the bodies and the ends of the transverse and spinous processes being cartilaginous about the sixteenth year five secondary centers appear one for the tip of each transverse process one for the extremity of the spinous process one for the upper and one for the lower surface of the body these fuse with the rest of the bone about the age of twenty-five exceptions to this mode of development occur in the first second and seventh cervical vertebrae and in the lumbar vertebrae atlas the atlas is usually ossified from three centers of these one appears in each lateral mass about the seventh week of fetal life and extends backward at birth these portions of bone are separated from one another behind by a narrow interval filled with cartilage between the third and fourth years they unite either directly or through the medium of a separate center developing in the cartilage at birth 
the anterior arch consists of cartilage in this a separate centre appears about the end of the first year after birth and joins the lateral masses from the sixth to the eighth year the lines of union extending across the anterior portions of the superior articular facets occasionally there is no separate centre the anterior arch being formed by the forward extension and ultimate junction of the two lateral masses sometimes this arch is ossified from two centres one on either side of the middle line epistrophius or axis the axis is ossified from five primary and two secondary centres the body and vertebral arch are ossified in the same manner as the corresponding parts in the other vertebrae namely one centre for the body and two for the vertebral arch the centres for the arch appear about the seventh or eighth week of fetal life that for the body about the fourth or fifth month the dens or odontoid process consists originally of a continuation upward of the cartilaginous mass in which the lower part of the body is formed about the sixth month of fetal life two centres make their appearance in the base of this process they are placed laterally and join before birth to form a conical bilobed mass deeply cleft above the interval between the sides of the cleft and the summit of the process is formed by a wedge-shaped piece of cartilage the base of the process is separated from the body by a cartilaginous disc which gradually becomes ossified at its circumference but remains cartilaginous in its centre until advanced age in this cartilage rudiments of the lower epiphyseal lamella of the atlas and the upper epiphyseal lamella of the axis may sometimes be found the apex of the odontoid process has a separate centre which appears in the second and joins about the twelfth year this is the upper epiphyseal lamella of the atlas in addition to these there is a secondary centre for a thin epiphyseal plate on the under surface of the body of the bone the seventh cervical vertebra the anterior or costal part of the transverse process of this vertebra is sometimes ossified from a separate centre which appears about the sixth month of fetal life and joins the body and posterior part of the transverse process between the fifth and sixth years occasionally the costal part persists as a separate piece and becoming lengthened lateral and forward constitutes what is known as a cervical rib separate ossific centres have also been found in the costal processes of the fourth fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae lumbar vertebrae the lumbar vertebrae have each two additional centres for the mammillary processes the transverse process of the first lumbar is sometimes developed as a separate piece which may remain permanently ununited with the rest of the bone thus forming a lumbar rib a peculiarity however rarely met with sacrum the body of each sacral vertebra is ossified from a primary centre and two epiphyseal plates one for its upper and another for its under surface while each vertebral arch is ossified from two centres the anterior portions of the lateral parts have six additional centres two for each of the first three vertebrae these represent the costal elements and make their appearance above and lateral to the anterior sacral foramina on each lateral surface two epiphyseal plates are developed one for the auricular surface and another for the remaining part of the thin lateral edge of the bone footnote the ends of the spinous processes of the three sacral vertebrae are sometimes developed from three separate epiphyses and fawcett states that a number of epiphyseal nodules may be seen in the sacrum at the age of eighteen years these are distributed as follows one for each of the mammillary processes of the first sacral vertebra twelve six on either side in connection with the costal elements two each for the first and second and one each for the third and fourth and eight for the transverse processes four on either side one each for the first third fourth and fifth he is further of opinion that the lower part of each lateral surface of the sacrum is formed by the extension and union of the third and fourth costal and fourth and fifth transverse epiphyses End of footnote. periods of ossification about the eighth or ninth week of fetal life ossification of the central part of the body of the first sacral vertebra commences and is rapidly followed by deposit of ossific matter in the second and third ossification does not commence in the bodies of the lower two segments until between the fifth and eighth months of fetal life between the sixth and eighth months ossification of the vertebral arches takes place and about the same time the costal centres for the lateral parts make their appearance 
the junctions of the vertebral arches with the bodies take place in the lower vertebrae as early as the second year but are not affected in the uppermost until the fifth or sixth year about the sixteenth year the epiphyseal plates for the upper and under surfaces of the bodies are formed and between the eighteenth and twentieth years those for the lateral surfaces make their appearance the bodies of the sacral vertebrae are during early life separated from each other by intervertebral fibrocartilages but about the eighteenth year the two lowest segments become united by bone and the process of bony union gradually extends upward with the result that between the twenty-fifth and thirtieth years of life all the segments are united on examining a sagittal section of the sacrum the situations of the intervertebral fibrocartilages are indicated by a series of oval cavities coccyx the coccyx is ossified from four centers one for each segment the ossific nuclei make their appearance in the following order in the first segment between the first and fourth years in the second between the fifth and tenth years in the third between the tenth and fifteenth years in the fourth between the fourteenth and twentieth years as age advances the segments unite with one another the union between the first and second segments being frequently delayed until after the age of twenty-five or thirty at a late period of life especially in females the coccyx often fuses with the sacrum End of section fifteen section sixteen of gray's anatomy part one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. anatomy of the human body part one by henry gray the vertebral column as a whole the vertebral column is situated in the median line as the posterior part of the trunk its average length in the male is about seventy one centimeters of this length the cervical part measures twelve point five centimeters the thoracic about twenty eight centimeters the lumbar eighteen centimeters and the sacrum and coccyx twelve point five centimeters the female column is about sixty one centimeters in length curves viewed laterally the vertebral column represents several curves which correspond to the different regions of the column and are called cervical thoracic lumbar and pelvic the cervical curve convex forward begins at the apex of the odontoid process and ends at the middle of the second thoracic vertebra it is the least marked of all the curves the thoracic curve concave forward begins at the middle of the second and ends at the middle of the twelfth thoracic vertebra its most prominent point behind corresponds to the spinous process of the seventh thoracic vertebra the lumbar curve is more marked in the female than in the male it begins at the middle of the last thoracic vertebra and ends at the sacrovertebral angle it is convex anteriorly the convexity of the lower three vertebrae being much greater than that of the upper two the pelvic curve begins at the sacrovertebral articulation and ends at the point of the coccyx its concavity is directed downward and forward the thoracic and pelvic curves are termed primary curves because they alone are present during fetal life the cervical and lumbar curves are compensatory or secondary and are developed after birth the former when the child is able to hold up its head at three or four months and to sit upright at nine months the latter at twelve or eighteen months when the child begins to walk the vertebral column also has a slight lateral curvature the convexity of which is directed toward the right side this may be produced by muscular action most persons using the right arm in preference to the left especially in making long continued efforts when the body is curved to the right side in support of this explanation it has been found that in one or two individuals who were left-handed the convexity was to the left side by others this curvature is regarded as being produced by the aortic arch an upper part of the descending thoracic aorta a view which is supported by the fact that in cases where the viscera are transposed and the aorta is on the right side the convexity of the curve is directed to the left side surfaces anterior surface when viewed from in front the width of the bodies of the vertebrae is seen to increase from the second cervical to the first thoracic there is then a slight diminution in the next three vertebrae below this there is again a gradual and progressive increase in width as low as the sacrovertebral angle from this point there is rapid diminution to the apex of the coccyx posterior surface 
the posterior surface of the vertebral column represents in the median line the spinous processes in the cervical region with the exception of the second and seventh vertebrae these are short and horizontal with bifid extremities in the upper part of the thoracic region they are directed obliquely downward in the middle they are almost vertical and in the lower part they are nearly horizontal in the lumbar region they are nearly horizontal the spinous processes are separated by considerable intervals in the lumbar region by narrower intervals in the neck and are closely approximated in the middle of the thoracic region occasionally one of these processes deviates a little from the median line a fact to be remembered in practice as irregularities of this sort are attendant also on fractures or displacements of the vertebral column. On either side of the spinous processes is the vertebral groove, formed by the laminae in the cervical and lumbar regions, where it is shallow, and by the laminae and transverse processes in the thoracic region, where it is deep and broad. These grooves lodge the deep muscles of the back. Lateral to the vertebral grooves are the articular processes, and still more laterally the transverse processes. In the thoracic region, the transverse processes stand backward, on a plane considerably behind that of the same processes in the cervical and lumbar regions. In the cervical region, the transverse processes are placed in front of the articular processes, lateral to the pedicles, and between the intervertebral foramina. In the thoracic region, they are posterior to the pedicles, intervertebral foramina, and articular processes. In the lumbar region, they are in front of the articular processes, but behind the intervertebral foramina. Lateral surfaces. The lateral surfaces are separated from the posterior surface by the articular processes in the cervical and lumbar regions, and by the transverse processes in the thoracic region. They present, in front, the sides of the bodies of the vertebrae, marked in the thoracic region by the facets for articulation with the heads of the ribs. More posteriorly are the intervertebral foramina, formed by the juxtaposition of the vertebral notches, oval in shape, smallest in the cervical and upper part of the thoracic regions, and gradually increasing in size to the last lumbar. They transmit the spinal nerves, and are situated between the transverse processes in the cervical region, and in front of them in the thoracic and lumbar regions. Vertebral Canal the vertebral canal follows the different curves of the column. It is large and triangular in those parts of the column which enjoy the greatest freedom of movement, namely the cervical and lumbar regions, and is small and rounded in the thoracic region where motion is more limited. Abnormalities. Occasionally the coalescence of the laminae is not completed, and consequently a cleft is left in the arches of the vertebrae, through which a protrusion of the spinal membranes, dura mater and arachnoid, and generally the medulla spinalis itself takes place, constituting the malformation known as spina bifida. This condition is most common in the lumbosacral region, but it may occur in the thoracic or cervical region, or the arches throughout the whole length of the canal may remain incomplete. End of section 16